This is Ray Weiss. He's my friend and former colleague at MIT. He joined the MIT faculty in 1964, and I joined the faculty in 1966. We overlapped at MIT for more than 40 years. Ray is truly brilliant. More than 45 years ago, he conceived of a concept that would perhaps make it possible to detect gravitational waves here on Earth. He dedicated his entire life to that. And out of this grew an enormous project, which is known as LIGO, L-I-G-O. They succeeded in 2015 to detect the first gravitational wave. And since then they have detected many. For this, Ray, jointly with Kip Thorne of Caltech, received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2017. That was an absolute <laughs> guarantee, of course. We all knew he was going to get it. Ray has received countless awards. I will not even mention them. I suggest you Google him. Ray Weiss. Last night, October 26, 2018, my wife and I went to his talk, very prestigious keynote speaker at Yukon, University of Connecticut. It was back the audience, it was wonderful to see him again. My wife took some pictures, of course, of Ray and me. I taped, recorded a few parts. I was planning to tape the whole thing, but my wife said, you know, that we were sitting in the front row, that it might be distracting him. And so I only took a few shots throughout, a total of eight minutes. Ten short portions, short parts, a total of eight minutes. So, in a way, you can get the flavor of this incredible discovery, but it's not a very coherent talk because you only see ten slices, which I have taken at random. All right, I hope you enjoy it. And have a nice day, of course. Today is now Saturday, October 27. Ray is brilliant. Not only did he perceive of this interferometer concept, but he carried it through in an impressive way, which took him more than 40 years. Read about him. Google him. It's become active now, and it's a very important instrument. There's a research detector in, in Germany, in Hannover. It's about 600 years long. And then there are planned detectors in the Kagura, in Ka, uh, the Kagura it's called, in the Kamioka mine, that is in Japan, where the neutrino detector is. And they've dug a big tunnel, and they're building a detector that's three kilometers inside the mountain. That's an interesting thing they're doing. They're trying to get around that gravity gradient noise as best as they can. And they'll make a little improvement. And then there's another, and that will be ready, we hope, in about 2020. And this is a detector which is built in India using a detector that was also built by LIGO. I won't go into the history of that, but they hope to be on the air by 2025. 
And I will show you in the sort of at the end of the talk why it's so important to have many detectors, but I'll anticipate it here. You, in order to tie yourself to what the astronomers do, and we want to do ultimately, and this became very important, as you see in a few minutes, when you start looking with many different channels at the universe, you not only look with gravitational waves and optical and infrared and, and neutrinos and everything, all of those things become much more useful if we can tell in a gravitational signal where on the sky the signal comes from. That's very important. And we can't do that with two detectors, as you'll see in a minute. You can only, because yeah, there's no way to point a gravitational wave detector. You can only have to measure time differences, and you'll see this now when we get to what the detection was. In, a, in, a, in a few, another couple of slides. So let me give you a quick travel log of LIGO. This won't take long. This is the Louisiana site looking above. And here is the site in, at, at Hanford, Washington. And here, and here is the beam tube itself. That's a very, very high vacuum. And the laser beams operate in there. This is a laser table like in her lab. And uh, that's the standard kind of thing. And here is the control room in Louisiana and people learning how to operate the instrument. And that's a whole art. You have to learn how to do a lot of servo locking and a whole bunch of stuff. So that's as much as I show you. I do want to show you this picture because it's important for historical purposes. And what it is, is this, and it's a little bit, if you have ambitions, you might learn something. One pendulum, there's another pendulum hanging from that, and another pendulum hanging from that, and here's this very precious mirror that's not supposed to move very much. And so I don't know if you, if you ever, I mean, there's one invention that is useful to you guys. That isn't very useful. That's sort of the very delicate little thing. But what is the basis of it? If you have, let's say, here's what you do. If I took my pants off and I hang something, but and, oh, well, not my pants off, but my belt off. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, well, what happened is that that you would notice the following. If you hang, you can do this at home. It's not <laughs> hard. Hang a hang a cup from a piece of piece of uh, string, and you'll notice the following. If you, this is the Earth right here, and if you move very slowly, they move together. It's like that. But if this moves fast, this doesn't move at all. That's just F equals MA. That's, that's just basic physics. And that, that's part of it, obviously. The other reason I couldn't talk about it, we weren't sure of it. I mean, the, the discovery was uh, in September of 2015. We got this thing, which is sort of amazing. It's huge. And what you see here in these pictures, this is time. And this is strain. And look at this. This is 10 to minus 21 is the scale. And here is 1 times 10 to minus 21. And this is junk. A little out of the junk. This is a living This is in, in Louisiana. A signal begins to develop out of that. And there it gets quite big. And then this is junk again. And then it becomes nothing. This is the same thing seen at Hanford, but not exactly at the same time. So let me show you how what you have. The signal, this signal was 7 milliseconds, 7 thousandth of a second ahead of that one. And that was the time it took for the signal to go from Louisiana through the Earth to find itself in, in, in Washington State. That's the first indication we had that these waves, if they were truly gravitational waves, travel close to the velocity of light. That was the first indication we had. So then you do little tricks like this, and you superpose them, sliding the data. And you can see this is junk. They don't look much the same. But there's noise in them. There's no denying it. But there's something evolves in both of them that looks pretty much the same. But it's not identical. It can't be identical because there's noise in the system. And that thing was then interpreted. And uh, here's another way to interpret it, which is sort of a nice way because we need this when we get to the next discovery. What this is, is the same data, but expressed in such a way that you hear it. And you look, what are the frequency components in that signal? So here's time again. And here are the signals that we were plotting before as time series. But this is now something in frequency. Let's plot it over here. This is the bottom of the piano, right about there, so 20 hertz. Here's middle C at 256. And here is a thing that is the sort of sonogram of, of this thing expressed as a sound. It, and where it's brightest is where it's strongest. And that's a, these are the same pictures that both at Hanford and in Livingston, uh, in Washington State and and. And very shortly after that, and there was this indication, this is on 9th of September 14th, 2015. Here's one that was measured October 12th, 2015. And here's one that was, this is the one that really, I, I finally made me believe. And this is in September 26th of 15. That one was seen by LIGO. And there's the one with Virgo with the same pictures as before. It wasn't very wonderful, but they had a real signal. It's, it's a four sigma signal. These were five sigma signals. And here's the important piece of information that came out of that. Here's a picture of the sky. 
And if you take LIGO alone, it would have an uncertainty in the sky, a big banana like that. That's about a thousand square degrees. It is a church. And you'll see it's getting higher and higher in frequency in any play for it. Okay? I hope I can do that. Uh, this is a completely different sort. I may not be able to do it. These are two neutron stars. Okay, that's a shame. Not too bad. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I, did that. <laughs> I was worried about the computer having gone completely nuts. Okay. <laughs> That's a real chirp. And that now is a lot lighter. These are 1.4 solar mass we think in the 70s. And here was real proof for it for the first time. The other thing that people had guessed at is that where the heavy elements are made, the very heavy elements, they're not made in stars, they're not made in the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the initial moment of the creation of the universe. And, uh, but uh, you can get hydrogen and helium out of that, but you don't get much else out of it. And you see this color coding. <coughs> Well, here's a periodic table for those of you who recognize it. And this color coding tells you the source of which these things were made. And most of us thought that we knew that it wasn't made in the Big Bang, possibly made in exploding stars or a supernova, and different classes of stars, but green and yellow are sort of most of the average things. But all the things that are blue and purple in here were not, they were not able to get high enough, long enough to Presentation, uh, but, but you heard it already. <laughs> I heard it again. Uh, sometimes I can listen to Wagner more than once. <laughs> um, Professor Weiss has graciously agreed to take some questions. If anybody would like help to help me with that, because my hearing is not as good as it used to be. So, if you can translate the <laughs> question, I may not be able to hear it as well. Okay, well, we'll pass you the microphone. Yeah, oh. we'll use a microphone. That's the way to do it. Hi, you said we should ask you about the polarization 